This is a homework problem, uh, number 25 from chapter 9. And this is the type of uh, torque problem that you hope is on the uh, midterm, because this is just really, really easy. All of the forces are perpendicular to all of the lever arms, and you don't have to deal with any angles. This is the, the ideal kind of problem. Uh, and what you have here is a painter with a mass of 70 kilograms. I'll put that up on the board here. <clears throat> and he's standing on a platform that has a mass of 40 kilograms. And we have these two cables that are uh, attached as, you, as, as, is in the, as in the picture. <clears throat> and we want to know the tension in those two cables. Now these tension forces are acting on the platform. So I need to draw an extended free body diagram of the platform. The first force that I put on that diagram, of course, is the weight force. And since the platform has a mass of 40 kilograms, it has a weight of 400 newtons. And I put that force always right at the center of mass, which in this case would be the center of that platform. I then ask, are there any magnets in this problem? No. So what touches the platform? Well, the painter is pushing down with a normal force that is equal to his weight, 700 newtons. I know that from a free body diagram of the painter and Newton's third law. There's also the two tension forces in the left cable and in the right cable. And that's what I'm looking for. <clears throat> now again, I know that the old rules still apply. All the force down has to still balance all the force up. So whatever these two are, they have to add up to 1100 newtons because 700 plus 400 is 1100. Okay, so I only have to find one of these, and I know what the other one is, okay? Now, in order to eliminate one of these unknown forces, I carefully choose the location of my pivot in order to, to balance the clockwise and the counterclockwise torques. Now, there are only two reasonable places to put the pivot. The platform's not rotating about any point, so I'm free technically, if I'm really good at math, to choose any point in the universe. But if I choose this point here, I will eliminate this unknown force. If I choose this point here, I will eliminate this unknown fo force from the equation. Well, I'm going to choose <coughs> this point over here. And now, when I balance all the clockwise torque with all the counterclockwise torque, um, again, I pretend that there's a great big spike going through that beam, that platform, right at the pivot, forcing this platform to rotate about that pivot as if it were a hinge. And then I ask for each of these forces, is it trying to make that thing go clockwise or counterclockwise? Well, this one is not trying to turn it at all, not around that pivot because it's acting at the pivot with no lever arm. This force is trying to make the platform go clockwise, as is this one, whereas this one's trying to make it go counterclockwise. So when I balance the torques, this is what my equation looks like. Uh, one moment while I get my pointer. <clears throat> For clockwise torques, I have this weight of the platform times its lever arm, or distance to the pivot, which is half a meter. I then have the push down by the painter of 700 newtons times its lever arm, or distance to the pivot, which is one meter. Trying to make it go counterclockwise is this tension in the right cable times its lever arm, of 1.5 meters, distance to the pivot. When I solve that for the tension in the right cable, I get 600 newtons. 
Again, all the force up has to balance all the force down by Newton's second law with zero acceleration of the center of mass. And that means the other cable must have a tension force of 500 newtons. Okay? Now, <clears throat> that's the type of question you hope is on the final. This is type, the type of question that you hope is not on the final exam. Uh, this is one of your homework problems, and it deals with a drawbridge that is 24 meters long. And we're told that the mass of the drawbridge is 2,000 kilograms. We're also told that there are two cables, and these two cables are pulling with the same tension force, and they're pulling a distance of eight meters from this point right here, okay? So uh, that's not shown on the slide, but that is, uh, it's in the, the problem. Um, the two cables are attached to the bridge at a location eight meters from the hinge. Okay. And that's what we're looking for is the tension in each one of these cables. Um, if I wasn't afraid of getting into trouble, I would draw on the screen an arrow that went from here to here, and that would be eight meters. Now, those tension forces are pulling on the drawbridge. So I should draw an extended free body diagram of the drawbridge. Now, the first force I put on any free body diagram is that weight force. If the mass is 2,000 kilograms, the weight force is going to be 20,000 newtons. Then I ask, are there any magnets? No. So what touches the drawbridge? Well, I have those two cables pulling eight meters from the hinge, and then I've got a whole bunch of messy forces at the hinge. I mean, I don't know what the total is for that hinge, but I, I know some of it's to the right and some of it's up, okay? I don't know what that is, and I don't want to know. That's not part of the problem. And that tells me where I should choose to put my pivot. I should put my pivot right there at that hinge. Well, wait a minute, Greg. It's the hinge. It's the, the point at which the drawbridge rotates. Of course that's the pivot. Well, I forgot to tell you something about this drawbridge. This drawbridge hasn't been lowered for 400 years. It's so rusted I don't think it could lower. I don't think that uh, hinge is any more hinge than any other part of the drawbridge. I chose this point because I wanted to mathematically eliminate these forces that I don't know and I don't want to know. If I put my pivot there, they have no lever arm, so they don't enter into my torque equation. Now I can balance all the clockwise torque with the counterclockwise torque. But before I do, I've got to recognize that this problem is a little bit different than the last one. In the last problem, all of the forces were acting perpendicular to their lever arms. But if you look at this weight force, it's pointing down towards the center of the earth, and the position vector is going from the pivot out to where the force is applied, okay? And so I have to break up this weight force into a part that's perpendicular to the position vector and a part that is anti-parallel to the position vector. Now, I can think of both of those forces, the blue force and the green force, as being as acting right there at the center of mass. If you think of that as a blue string and a green string that are both tied right here, 
the blue one pulling this way and the green one pulling this way. You can see that that green string, it's pulling right towards that, uh, that pivot uh, that I've defined. So this gives me no torque. What I've just done is use the useful force method of finding a torque. I use all of the position vector, all of the vector from the pivot to where the force is applied, but only that part of the force that's perpendicular to the position vector. Okay? Now, how do I find that? Well, you remember from when we were solving problems involving a hill or a ramp, that what we would do is we would think of this as a spike that's driven through this nail. And we think of the weight force as the plumb bob, the mass on a string that's forced to always hang down. And when I increase the angle that the board makes with horizontal, that's going to increase the angle that the spike makes with the plumb bob. And so I know that this angle here has to also be 53 degrees if that angle is 53 degrees. And now I can use my basic trig functions to recognize that this is going to be 20,000 times the cosine of 53 degrees. So that's going to be the part of the weight that is perpendicular is going to be 20,000 newtons times the cosine of 53 degrees. Well, the cosine of 53 degrees is 0 0.6, and that's going to give me 12,000 newtons. Now, if this whole drawbridge is 24 meters, then the distance from the pivot to where that force is applied is going to be 12 meters. And that means that when I balance all the clockwise torque with all the counterclockwise torque, this blue force is trying to make the drawbridge rotate clockwise about this pivot. And that's going to be the force times the distance to the pivot of 12 meters. Now, the tension force is trying to make it go counterclockwise. And each one of those forces has a torque of the tension times the distance of 8 meters. Tension times 8 meters. And because there's two of them, rather than write it twice, I just put a 2 out in front. Now, if I solve for T, what I get is 9,000 newtons. 9,000 newtons, okay? Now, that's not uh, a whole lot harder, uh, but it does have that extra wrinkle in it where you have to break up this force here into its parts, its perpendicular part, the useful part, and the parallel part, the part that does no torque. Now, I could have also worked this problem using the lever arm method. In other words, I would have uh, taken all of the 20,000 newtons and I would compute uh, how big this lever arm is. Remember, the lever arm is the distance that goes from the pivot to the line of action and, and intersects it perpendicularly. Okay? And uh, that would have been an easy problem to solve. This would have been 12 meters, that would have made this um, 12 meters times the cosine of 53 degrees, and uh, we would have gotten the same answer. Okay. <clears throat> now this problem is truly, truly beautiful. This problem involves both torque and fluids. Okay, what we have here is a meter stick. It's one meter long. And uh, we find that it has a weight of four newtons. We also find that if we pull on it with a string with a force of six newtons to the right, 
and we pull on it with another string with two newtons down, that we can balance this whole thing so that it just stays put. It doesn't go up, it doesn't go down, it doesn't go left, it doesn't go right, and it doesn't rotate. But I have to pull with a third string. And the question here is, where do I attach the string? What's this distance from the left side? And how hard should I pull? Oh, and there's a third piece. What direction should I pull? So there's three pieces of information that I need to know. Where do I pull? How hard do I pull? And what angle do I pull at? Okay? Now, um, this sounds like a really, really hard problem. But it turns out it's just brutally, brutally simple. Now, we can see that these forces are acting on the meter stick. So, <clears throat> let's draw an extended free body diagram of that meter stick. Okay? Now, I know that I have a weight force of 4 newtons. I have a tension of 2 newtons. I have a tension of 6 newtons. I also have a buoyant force here. And I have this force, we're going to call it T3. <coughs> now, the first thing I want to do is find this buoyant force. We're given in the problem that the volume of the meter stick is 3 times 10 to the minus 4 meters cubed. Well, that's not really the type of units that we're used to. Um, but it's going to be a useful set of units if we just want to plug into the equation where the buoyant force is equal to the density times the volume times g. Because g is 10 newtons for each kilogram, I would like this to be in kilograms. Well, if I write my density of water to be 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed, now I can put this in here, 3 times 10 to the minus 4 meter cubed, and you see that the meter cubes cancel out, the kilograms cancel out, and what I'm left with is newtons. And if I multiply that out, what I get is 3 newtons. Okay? If you need to pause the video right now and convince yourself that that's the case, uh, go ahead and do that. So what I've got here is 3 newtons. Now, let me just point out that there's three things we're looking for. We're looking for this distance r, and we're looking for this pull, and we're looking for the angle. In the problem, they ask us for the angle relative to the vertical. So I want that angle there. Well, let me break this T3 into two pieces, uh, components we call them. Let's call it the Tx and Ty. So now, what I'm looking for are three things. What's Tx? What's Ty? And what is R? That seems like a lot, but not really, because I have three big ideas 
each idea that's going to give me one of those things I'm looking for. First of all, I know that the center of mass of this meter stick is not accelerating. That means all the force to the left has to equal all the force to the right. Well, I only have one force to the right. That means this force to the left, Tx, has to be 6 newtons. This has to balance that. The second big idea. Because the center of mass is not accelerating vertically, all the force up has to balance all the force down. Well, I got six newtons down. I got to have six newtons up. Well, that's three of it. So I drew this too long. That means this must be three newtons. Okay. Now the last big idea <clears throat> is that the torques about any point, any point, have to balance, okay? They have to add up to zero. And so that allows me to solve for uh, R, okay? Let me choose my pivot point to be right here at the left end of the stick. That'll be my pivot. Now, which of these forces give me zero torque about that pivot? Well, T1 is acting right at that pivot. That gives me zero. Uh, Tx goes through that pivot, so that gives me zero. Um, T2 is uh, going away from the pivot, so it's got a line of action that goes through the pivot. That gives me zero. So it seems like there's only three forces that give me a torque about that pivot. I've got Ty, I've got the buoyant force, and I've got the weight. So let's balance all the clockwise torque with all the clockwise, a counterclockwise torque about that pivot. So which of these forces are trying to make it go clockwise? Well, just the weight. Ty and the buoyant force are trying to make it go counterclockwise. So if I put the clockwise torque as four newtons, times its lever arm of 0.5 meters, remember it's a meter stick, that has to equal the counterclockwise torque of the buoyant force times its distance to the pivot of 0.5 meters plus the uh, Ty, which is 3 newtons, times its lever arm, which is R. And if I solve this for R, I get one-sixth of a meter, okay? One-sixth of a meter. Now, we really solved this problem, but not in the form that we were asked to solve it. We were asked for the magnitude of the pole in string three and the angle that it made with the vertical. So let's go back and do that. Let's go back and do that. I know that this is one-sixth of a meter. If I go back and look at that force, um, I've got Ty equals to three newtons, and I've got Tx equal to six newtons, and that means that T3 is going to equal the square root of six newtons squared plus three newtons squared. And uh, I also know that I can find this angle here. That was the angle that we were asked to find, the angle that that string made with the vertical. Well, I can just use my inverse tangent function and say that the angle is equal to the inverse tangent of the opposite side 
divided by the adjacent or touching side. And that's going to give me 63.4 degrees. Okay? So that problem is probably a little bit harder than what you might expect on, a, on an exam. Okay? Just a little bit harder than what you would expect on an exam. Okay, let's move on. <clears throat> Greg's pointy head. Um, we have this beam that has a mass of 20 kilograms. Uh, let me put this up on the board. <clears throat> problem is 5.6 kilograms and as you can see there the length of the beam is 10 meters <clears throat> and uh, we have it attached to a rope on one end uh, a half meter from the left hand side and uh, we have the right hand side being supported by Griggs pointy head and the question is, um, if, if that box is three meters from the right-hand side, uh, how much is Greg pushing on that, um, on that beam? Um, let me find this problem here. Uh, the first part of the problem asks us to find, uh, draw an extended free body diagram of the beam. So let's do that. <clears throat> if I draw that free body diagram, I have a weight force that's acting at the center, and that's 200 newtons. There are no magnets in the problem, so what touches the beam, well, I have this rope. I have the upward push of Greg's head. And I have this downward push of the box on the beam. And we know from a free body diagram of the box that that's going to be 56 newtons. Now, I've got two unknowns here. I've got the tension in the rope, and I've got the push by Greg's head on the beam. I don't know what they are, but I know they got to add up to 256, because all the force down has to balance all the force up. So, if I'm interested in finding the push by Greg's head, I better get rid of this other unknown. I can get rid of that unknown by choosing my pivot point to be right there. And now, when I balance all of the clockwise torque with all of the counterclockwise torque, well, if there's a spike going through that beam right there, then this weight force is trying to make the beam rotate clockwise about it. This normal by the box is trying to make it go clockwise. The push by Greg's head trying to make it go counterclockwise. So I'm going to have 200 newtons times this lever arm. Now remember, this is 5 meters, and that's a half meter there. So this lever arm here is going to be 4.5 meters. Now, I also add this 56 newtons 
times its lever arm. Well, if that's five, and this is three meters, and this is going to be two meters, and the distance from this force to the pivot is going to be 4.5 plus 2, or 6.5 meters. That's going to equal the normal force that we're looking for by Greg's head on the beam times its lever arm of 9.5 meters. And at this point, I've drawn a blank, and I can't remember what that turns out to be. But when I solve that for the normal force by Greg on the beam, I get 133 newtons. And that's part B. The free body diagram was part A. Well, part C asks us to find the tension by the rope on the beam. Well, I know the tension by the rope on the beam plus the normal by Greg on the beam have to add up to 256 newtons. That's all the force down. And so that means the tension by the rope on the beam is equal to 256 newtons minus 133 newtons equals 123 newtons. Now part D, uh, this is an old exam question, and part D was the part that people had a little bit of trouble with. They said in the problem that the rope breaks if the tension in the rope is greater than 150 newtons. Well, the tension in the rope is only 123 newtons, so we're good, we're good. But part D says, what if we slide that box to the left? Well, the further we slide it to the left, the bigger the tension is going to get in that rope. And eventually, we're going to get that box so far to the left that the tension is going to get to be 150, and if it goes any bigger than that, we're going to break the rope. So the question in part D is, how far can I slide that box before it breaks the rope? So in part D, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my pivot over here. Why do I do that? I'm going to call that the pivot for part D. I do that because when I slide that box, both the tension in the rope and the force by Greg's pointy head are going to change. But I really don't care about the force by Greg's pointy head anymore. That was part B. What I care about is uh, when do I get that tension force in the rope to its maximum value of 150 newtons. And so if I choose my pivot point here, I'm going to eliminate the force that I don't care about, namely the push by Greg's head. So now, <clears throat> If I balance the clockwise torque with all the counterclockwise torque, well, about this pivot here, the tension in the rope is the only one that's trying to make it go clockwise, and these other two are trying to make it go counterclockwise. So my clockwise torque would be, and let's say that tension in the rope is the maximum value that it can get, 150 newtons and its lever arm, or distance to the pivot, would be 9.5 meters. Well, the weight force is going to be counterclockwise. That's going to be 200 newtons times its lever arm of 5 meters. And let's say that we now move this box over here, a distance x from the right-hand side. Well, this box is still going to weigh 56 newtons. So my, my torque in the counterclockwise direction is going to be 56 newtons 
times x meters. Well, it, we'll just call it x and put the units inside there. If I solve that for x, I get x is equal to 7.59 meters. Now, you would think that that would be the answer, and if you put that on the exam, you'd get full credit. But technically, the question asks, how far could I slide the box from its original position? It was already three meters from the right-hand side. If it ends up at 7.59 meters, then I can slide it 4.59 meters left before the rope, spelled with an O, breaks. Okay? <clears throat> now, that was fun. Again, that was an old exam question, and so that's the level at which you should be able to solve these rotational dynamic problems or torque problems. We've got one last problem here before we close, and that is this Bob and Will again. And once again, Will is just not helping. Bob is doing all the heavy lifting, and Will is just pretending to help. We're told that Will just pushes horizontally with a force of 400 newtons. That just isn't doing anything. If anything, it just makes Bob's life more difficult. Okay? Now, if I draw a free body diagram for that beam, and let me first of all give you some information. Uh, the mass of the beam is going to be uh, 90 kilograms. The length of the beam, as you can see, is 2 meters. It's supported on a roller a half meter from the right edge. And we're told that the normal force by will on the beam is 400 newtons left. So if I draw an extended free body diagram for this beam, I have the weight force that I put right at the center of the beam. And that, of course, is going to be 900 newtons if it has a mass of 90 kilograms. I then ask, are there any magnets in this problem? No. So what touches the beam? Well, I've got Will pushing on the beam, and we're told that this is 400 newtons. I also have a roller pushing up on the beam, and then I have Bob pushing at some angle. This would be the normal by Bob. And this is what we're looking for here, magnitude and direction. Well, again, I have three big ideas at play here. All the force left has to balance all the force right. All the force up has to balance all the force down. And the torques about any point have to uh, balance. So what we're looking for, if I break up this force by Bob into a, an X part and a Y part, Well, the X part I can figure out really quick, okay? Um, and I've drawn this too long. If all the force to the left has to be balanced by all the force to the right, this X part has to be 400 newtons 
to counteract what Will is pushing with. So you see Will's just making life harder for his brother Bob. Now, <clears throat> to find the Y part, I could balance all the upward force with all the downward force, but hey, I got two unknown forces in the vertical direction. I can't solve for two unknowns with one equation. So I choose to put a pivot point right here. Now again, you're saying, Greg, that's where it would rotate if it were rotating. Yes, I know. But that's not why I chose that as a pivot point. The beam's not rotated about any point. I could choose any point to be my pivot. I choose this point because this unknown force I don't care about. This one I do. If I choose my pivot here, this unknown drops out of my equation. So let's solve for this y part of Bob's push. If I balance all the clockwise torque with all the counterclockwise torque, um, this gives me no torque about that pivot. This gives me no torque about that pivot. This gives me no torque about that pivot. The only two forces that give me torque about this pivot are this force that's trying to make it go clockwise and this weight force that's trying to make it go counterclockwise. So I can write this as the y part of Bob's push times its distance to the pivot of 1.5 meters. Okay, that's from here to the pivot times the weight force times its lever arm of 0.5 meters. When I solve that for the unknown, I get 300 newtons. So now if I look at that push by Bob, he's got a push of 400 newtons to the right and a push of 300 newtons up well, his total push, you recognize this triangle, this is a three, four, five triangle. His total push would be 500 newtons at an angle of 37 degrees above the horizontal. And that's the first part of this problem. Now, the last part of the problem, and this, this makes me so happy. After all the Bob and Will problems, where Bob is doing all the work and Will is just slacking off, Bob finally gets fed up, and he walks away, okay? He just walks away. He says, Will, you're on your own, okay? And suddenly, Will has to, he has to figure out how to keep this thing from rotating or falling. And uh, I think you can convince yourself that what he's got to do to keep this thing from rotating uh, counterclockwise is he has to push straight down on the beam. And the question is, how hard should he push? Well, this is just like that problem that we had with the meter stick, where you see that this lever arm here is going to be half a meter. And this is going to give me a torque that's trying to make it go counterclockwise. This lever arm for the push by will is going to be half a meter. And it's trying to make it go clockwise. If those two torques are going to cancel out, then these two forces had better be the same. They've got the same lever arm. And so that means that this is going to be 900 newtons. Now I said that I don't care about how hard the roller is pushing, but Newton's second law still applies, and say I was interested, say I did care. Well, all the force up has to equal all the force down. I got 900 Newtons here down, I got 900 Newtons there down, this had better be 1800 Newtons, okay? And that, my friends, is the last problem that we're going to solve before that final exam. Remember, on Tuesday, you're going to have a four-hour window of time that's going to start at 9 in the morning and end at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. At 1 o'clock in the afternoon, you will no longer have access to that exam. 
Um, pick out a three hour window, a uh, block of time that you want to sit down in front of your computer and take that multiple choice question, question test at, at D2L. Thank you for a wonderful semester. I'm sorry that I can't see you right now. Uh, believe me, if, uh, if my whole career in teaching had been online, it would have lasted one semester, okay? This is not the way I like to teach. I'm looking at Shane here, and as, as, as much as I like him, it just ain't the same. So um, I hope to see you next semester in 207. I hope to see your smiling faces in these chairs right here. Um, have a great summer.